Dear colleagues, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you once more to this IPA webinar. As you might know, this is a long-term project organized by the website editorial committee and our aim is to foster the diffusion of central topics of the psychoanalytical theory as well as integrating interdisciplinary contributions on related themes. IPA worldwide structure enhances the possibility of organizing this open dialogue to share our ideas around the world. The title of this webinar is Immigrants and Refugees, How Can Psychoanalysis Contribute? Millions of people in the yearning for a better life or even in their struggle to survive are forced to endure situations of extreme suffering. The magnitude of these flows of immigrants and refugees is, in Freudian words, a sign of civilization and its discontent. Migration has many causes in which socioeconomic factors are intertwined with environmental determinants. Uh, over the last few months, we had many demonstrations around the world against climate change. These natural catastrophes, uh, together with uh, the fact that we are living a social economic period of changes that are a real assault to our democratic values, um, makes that too many think that the world is seems to be moving backwards. This uh, virtual forum is devoted to the reflection of this uh, pressing problem that uh, demands urgent social answers at all levels. Uh, a psychoanalyst committed with the defense of human rights, we need to know how can we contribute from our field to relieve the suffering of these victims? How to make sense of these tragic situations? Um, how best can we respond to this challenge? Now we'll have the opportunity to hear four psychoanalysts with a specific experience in help programs for refugee and immigrants, and afterwards we'll have an open dialogue with them. Um, they guide us in the framing of this problem, integrating core concepts of psychoanalytical theory in their uh, at, in intention to uh, discover the unconscious forces behind this great regression, as it has been called. Well, we are ready to begin, but before uh, passing over to the panelists, I'll explain very briefly how we are going to function. The webinar has two parts. The first part, will hear the panelists. The second part will have a question and answer slot. You may send your questions during the whole webinar. Look at the right side of the screen. You'll find a box entitled question. There you post your question and click them. Remember that they are going to be answered only after the panelists' presentations. You, uh, if you want, you also can download the panelist presentations. Look again at the right side of the screen in a pane called handouts. You simply have to click on the presentation you want to download and it will appear on your screen. 
Well, uh, a last comment. Uh, this is an open um, dialogue. All of us, panelists and presentations, we are responsible for our personal own opinions. Well, then now we'll begin with our third panelist, Dr. Marianne lausinger bolever Before I hand over to her, I read a very brief resume of her professional activities. She is director in charge of the Sigmund Freud Institute in Frankfurt. She's a professor emeritus for psychoanalysis at the University of Kassel City. Senior professor at IDA Excellency Center in Frankfurt and the University Medical School in Mainz. She's training analyst of the German Psychoanalytic Association and a member of the Swiss Psychoanalytic Society and the International Psychoanalytic Association. She has been involved in several IPA committees. Since 2010, she has been vice chair for Europe of the research board of IPA and since 2018 as chair of the IPA subcommittee for migration and refugees. Well, Marianne, uh, it's your turn. Uh, are you ready? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Shall I just start? Yeah, okay. Yes, please. Well, as Ines already told, dealing with traumatized refugees and migrants has become one of the most pressing topics of our world today, especially because it is inextricably linked to the global threat of the climate catastrophe. The resulting destruction of economic livelihoods and the struggle for resources combined with the diffuse feeling of inscrutable international dependencies are central causes of both armed conflicts, the so-called poverty migration, as well as the great regression and expression of Geiselberger that has led to a worldwide increase in nationalism, fundamentalism, and populist authoritarianism. We are experiencing a new shock to Western societies, a social, political, and cultural malaise of discomfort. Donald Trump, but also other populist authoritarian leaders like Duerte, Erdogan, or Modi, embody in many respects the negation of how the Western world describes itself, a society of self-control in which the forces of cultural progress are at home, promoting enlightenment, equality, and social integration. I quote, something has slipped in these societies. They are shaken in their self-image. Something raw and furious has now entered the, pop, pop, the political public sphere. It is shamelessly hated, dangerous feelings, fantasies of violence, and even desire to kill are frivolously articulated. So the sociologist Oliver Nachtwey. He thus speaks of a process of de-civilization. He refers to the dialectics of enlightenment, the dialectic der Aufklärung by Horkheimer and Adorno on the one hand, and Norbert Elias' theory of civilization on the other hand. It is important for us psychoanalysts to remember that one of the most important starting points for all these distinguished philosophers and social scientists is Sigmund Freud in his civilization and discontents. Psychoanalysis as a science of the unconscious may thus complement sociological and philosophical analysis and deepen them by unconscious dimensions towards an interdisciplinary understanding of these highly threatening destructive processes that are always mainly related to irrational factors. To mention just one example, as described in many classical psychoanalytical papers, the stranger, the foreigner, as a black sheet, is particularly well suited to attracting the projections of one's own tabooed wishes, conflict, and impulses. Banned into one's own unconscious, these are projected onto the foreigner, and then, in the sense of projective identification, thought in the stranger instead of within oneself. Freud has already pointed out this mechanism in mass psychology and deep analysis in 1941, 
He focused above all on Oedipal fantasies. In recent psychoanalytical papers, it has been discussed that the regressive processes not only affect the Oedipal developmental level, but also reawaken very early archaic fantasies. As for instance, Werner Bohleber elaborates, particularly in antisemitism, and in an analogous manner in Islamophobia, as well as in xenophobia, and the violence against migrants and refugees, such archaic, ubiquitous, unconscious fantasy systems are triggered. The foreigner evokes, for instance, the phantasma of purity, a narcissistic fantasy of merging with the primary object, and the Schmelzing fantasy, which is always evoked by nationalistic feelings and thinking. According to this phantasma, the foreigner, by his presence, pollutes the pure ideal of the homeland, the father or motherland, the nation. Another archaic fantasy is built on early sibling rivalry and envy. The foreigner is experienced as a greedy, voracious intruder who takes away jobs, prosperity, and social welfare, and sucks out the German, the American, and so on. One's own failure, loss of job, poverty, and all personal misery is unconsciously ascribed to the other. Another reason for hostile reactions to refugees lies in that war refugees also evoke unconscious association linked to trauma in other words, to extreme experiences that expose the self to fear of death, helplessness, and powerlessness, inundate the self in such a way that basic trust in helpful others and one's own self agencies collapse. Peter Fonati talks about the epistemic trust that collapse. The biologically rooted flight impulse is one of the obvious reactions to the perception of trauma and traumatized persons. It is the impulse to look away, to deny, and to turn a blind eye to the unbearable, as John Steiner has called this. We need to reflect and to counteract these impulses in order to be able to emphasize these traumatized refugees and immigrants and to offer them what Bruce Springsteen called just a little of that human touch. On this theoretical and clinical background, we conceptualized on the high peak of the refugee crisis in Germany in 2015, the pilot project step by step for supporting traumatized refugees in a first reception institution in the Michaelisdorf, the Michaelis village in Darmstadt. The pilot project proved to be helpful for supporting many refugees in the sense of a first step arriving in Germany after mostly extreme traumatic experience in their homelands and during the flight, even, in, even if this was only mainly a drop in the ocean. Therefore, it has been the model for implementing four sustaining psychosocial centers in the state of Hessen for psychosocial and psychotherapeutic support of refugees in the sense of second steps. In the intensive supervision of the various teams in the Michaelisdorf as first step, it was supervision of all the teams, social workers, medical teams, administration, even the security men, but of course also the young people, the students who were working there, and the lay helpers. The psychoanalytic knowledge of the short and long-term effects of traumatization due to man-made disaster proved to be very helpful. Yolanda Gambe will talk about that because this knowledge comes mainly from Holocaust research. In addition, various offers were made for all age groups, for instance, mother with infant therapeutic painting groups for children in the kindergarten and in, in primary school, groups for adolescents and adults, as well as a weekly psychoanalytic consultation and crisis intervention based on clinical and conceptual psychoanalytic knowledge. I myself was in the Michaelisdorf at least one day a week for two years. The weekly crisis intervention with severely traumatized refugees let me feel a new deep gratitude to psychoanalysis. The many years of training and clinical experience helped me 
to professionally at least try to counter the defense mechanism of turning a blind eye, to recognize the extreme flooding by unbearable emotions and fantasies, as well as embodied psychosomatic reactions in my own counter-transference caused by the co confrontation with the severely traumatized refugees. It also enabled me at least to some extent to hold and to contain the traumatized without being traumatized myself. The psychoanalytic attitude and knowledge made it thus possible for many refugees to find their way out of the first state of mental and physiological shock in the sense of a first step and to regain access to their frozen emotion. To mention just one example, Mrs. A from Afghanistan, she had been in a, in a severe state of shock for weeks and in a depression, had a lot of psychosomatic reactions and was highly suicidal. When she came to my crisis intervention, she was sitting in front of me with what we call a frozen state and was silent for about 10 to 15 minutes. In my own count transference, I felt the panic, the despair, the, uh, but also very, very archaic kind of guilt feelings. And then I asked her what she had gone through. So she took out her handy and she showed me the picture of a beautiful young girl and told me that was my daughter. She was uh, taken out of the school by the Taliban and killed, and I couldn't even say goodbye to her. Saying this, she started to cry, and she cried and cried and cried, and uh, uh, was it was just a situation where I felt uh, very close to her and tried to hold her. So she said at the end, she said, well, you made my heart feeling, uh, uh, having feelings again, and she left. She had been persecuted because she was engaged in human, in, in, uh, in rights for women. And she started already in the Matayeli store to engage for, for rights for women again. And she still does this. So as a first step, it was essential for her to get her out of this state of a shock. This is one example where I think uh, psychoanalysis has something to offer. And I'm very glad for the opportunity to share with you this experience. Of course, it really is a drop in, in the big ocean of pain and despair. But I think Greta Thunberg is right. Our grandchildren will ask us, what did you do in this situation? And uh, why didn't you think what psychoanalysis has to offer to this current crisis of refugees and climate catastrophe. I'm very glad that we have the possibility to think about our possibility to offer something to the current very threatening situation. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, very much for sharing with us all your experience in this pressing worldwide situation. Well, now is the turn of our second panelist, Dr. Sver Varbin. I tell you very briefly about some of his related scientific activities. He's a training and supervising analyst at the New Region Psychoanalytic Society. He's a professor at the Oslo Metropolitan University. He's working clinically and with research on traumatization and the treatment of traumatized patients, especially in the refugee field. He has twice been president of the Norwegian Psychoanalytic Society, and he has had several positions in the IPA. Presently, he's chair of the IPA China Committee. Well, sir, it's over to you now. Mm, thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, underline what Marianne Loisinger-Bolebe just said, that these meetings with humanity and empathy is so important. And it can last, uh, it can be a very important factor that contributes to, uh, to help people to move on. We have recently made a large interview study of many refugees, almost 200, 
about their flight and what do they say uh, very many is that there was one country where they felt welcomed where they felt people listened to them took care of them uh, and uh, and this was greece the other countries it was really hard experiences and these welcoming moments even if it the uh, conditions was very very was very poor was uh, something that was kept in their heart but in my contribution i will uh, focus more on the problematic side uh, as we know western countries are now in the throes of a wave of xenophobia fomented by a noisy right-wing movement but now supported by many governments and leaders as marianne pointed out ordinary people are placed in a position as bystanders and witnesses who fail to help and who allow refugees to suffer under increasing dehumanizing conditions at the borders of western countries this failure of the bystander the witness is central to the post-traumatic condition as it confirms the experience of helpless abandonment during traumatization Refugees uh, and asylum seekers have become the chosen strangers of the European and Western political scene. They embody danger, they are perceived as carriers of trauma, as Marianne pointed out, which intrinsically and naively is associated with a simplistic trope about violence. Yesterday's victims may become tomorrow per tomorrow's perpetrator. The, the mere possibility of being destroyed and the nameless anxieties connected with the atrocities that many refugees have experienced contribute to making the traumatized into frightening alliance, ready to be cast in narratives about fundamentalist, but also fascinating and frightening Islam. Refugees flee from war, persecution, imprisonment and torture. Many refugees have suffered adverse and complex trauma traumatic experiences in their countries of origins, extending to childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. Uh, that may, and this may con contribute to increasing the severity of mental health symptoms. Uh, in addition, adverse dehumanizing experiences during flight and challenges in the exile country add to their burden. Dehumanization is a process that is simultaneously social, political, and psychological, in which fundamental human characteristics are disavowed in the other people, such that others are perceived as less than human or non-human. Consequently, actions resulting from dehumanization can threaten the basic rights of these others and endanger their life and safety dehumanization on a so societal scale goes hand in hand with xenophobia when xenophobia becomes part of a political or religious narrative and is used to foster intergroup conflict and conscious processes both at individual and group level are set in motions these unconscious motivational forces are organized at primitive levels as Marianne just described, uh, and involve fantasies that may be shared by many people in a group or community. The overall situation for refugees uh, during flight has worsened significantly in recent years. The walls around Europe and other Western countries has become higher and more brutal. Many refugees live in camps or detentions around outside Western countries in centers, uh, centers with extreme lack of the most of food, health, ser health services, schooling, protection. And there are many, many bad examples. And there are quite worrying reports now of maltreatment, torture, abduction, trafficking along the route, often by official people, police, uh, border guards, and so on. The mental health status of refugees in non-Western countries seems serious, that the people who are in the refugee camps. 
uh, high levels of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, and uh, also a uh, high level of depression and anxiety. It is no reasonable, reasonable evidence that refugees during flight in temporary stay in different countries, refugees camps and upon arrival in host countries may have a multitude of problems regarding mental health, somatic health, social adjustment and acculturation. The increasing xenophobic attitudes and the harsh rejection and return politics existing especially, especially in Western countries make the situation qualitatively different from what we, for example, saw when refugees arrived from the Balkan Wars in the 1990s. Millions of people now live in more or less uh, adequately equipped refugee fa facilities throughout the world. And there's no more than 70 million of forcibly uh, 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 displaced uh, people. More than 5 million people, uh, an increase of 5 million people since the big refugee crisis in 2015. And they have experienced a broad range of uh, really uh, horrible experiences that can produce traumatization. It's uh, near-death experiences, seeing close one be maltreated or killed, torture, rape, and so forth. Uh, and as a result, there is a, uh, when people arrive, there is a high level of mental health problems. And there are also uh, mental health problems that are long-standing, that are not easily repaired, and we also know that uh, they uh, get inadequate help and some get almost no help at all. In our research, we found that people waited for eight to ten years before they got any contact with the health services. What is very important here is that what happens after traumatization is uh, maybe more important than uh, the actual traumatization uh, in the war, for example. Uh, and that is why Marianne's example is so important. Uh, because the, the, the meeting uh, of uh, empathy and humanity when they arrive it has um, probably, at, from the research we know, has a very important influence on what happens uh, later on. Uh, I think that it's um, important to, uh, to underline Dori Laub's important contribution to an understanding of extreme trauma. And he's uh, thinking of uh, how during extreme traumatization, the, uh, the link or the bond to an inner empathic object or other may be uh, destroyed or impaired. This is most important because what we see in long-term uh, conditions is that there is really this internal lack of hope. And we can see that as in Mariana's example, when they meet humanity. There is a repair of this inner empathic, or in the link to the empathic ob other, or empathic object. So I think that the um, psychoanalyst has really something important to contribute, both in our practice, but also in, to inform and to uh, supervise, to help, and not the least to uh, inform uh, the politicians about importance of uh, receiving refugees in a human way. Uh, I think I will stop there, but uh, uh, just uh, underline that uh, our understanding as a psychologist is vital for helping in the refugee crisis now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sver, for your clear uh, and in-depth description of this dehumanizing forces acting on helpless <laughs> victims. Um, so, um, now I would like to say a few words about Adriana Brengler, who is our next panelist. 
Adriana is the vice president elect of the International Psychoanalytic Association. She trained in clinical psychology and psychoanalysis in Caracas, Venezuela, before immigrating to the United States in 2010. She's a training and supervising analyst at the Northwestern Psychoanalytic Society and Institute in Seattle. She teaches there and also in Wuhan, China. She's chair of the IPA's Psychoanalysis Immigration and Relocation Committee <coughs> and has a private practice in Bellevue, Washington. She writes on clinical matters and applies psychoanalysis. Well, Adriana, if you'd like to begin. Thank you, Ines, for your presentation. Um, as uh, Sver said, the United Nations recently reported that in 2019, almost 71 million people around the world were displaced from their homes by natural disasters, war, or for political or religious reasons. These waves of emigration are what have created the new political realities the world is dealing with today. On one side, there are the nationalistic tendencies of many who are worried about defending their borders. And on the other side, there are those defending the rights of displaced people. Emigration is a complex process involving the loss of place, of personal history, of feelings of identity and belonging, of culture, of language, of everyday life. It is an uprooting from our land, our work, our family and friends, it often leaves deep psychic wounds and scars that remain for a lifetime. And all the examples and all the ideas that Marianne and Sver were telling us before are, of course, in a completely different level of suffering and trauma than someone who is, immig who is an immigrant. But even an immigrant who is not suffering all these terrible traumatic events, uh, it, it has also very, wound very deep wounds. Of all these aspects, perhaps one of the most difficult is the loss of identity. There is the feeling of no longer being the same person as the one who left the place of origin. By emigrating, we become a stranger, and not only to others, but to ourselves, since one does not recognize oneself in the same place, in the new place in the same way in the new place. Another aspect that confirms the fate of the immigrant as a foreign for life is the language of childhood. It is not by chance that we refer to our native language as the mother tongue. Language is the link with the mother of childhood, with our historical roots and our identity. The verbal, and non-verbal communication that allowed a first bond with the mother is partially lost with the immigration. The difference in language remains as a gap. This means that the immigrant can never take for granted what seems to be obvious and automatic for the natives of the new place. For the immigrant, immigrant many new words will not have the same meaning cultural reference and emotional significance that they have for the people who grew up with those words and references. As much as the new language is learned, it will be spoken in most cases with an accent and the immigrant will be recognized by it as a foreigner every time he or she says something. The handling of languages, both the language of origin and the adopted one will reflect the degree of identity and adaptation to the new place. As psychoanalysts, we understand the pain of immigrants and refugees, as Marianne and Sver were describing in a very, very emotional and moving way. Um, 
we, um, let me see, I, um, as psychoanalysts, we understand the pain of immigrants and refugees around the world, and we wish we could contribute to their lives and in some way relieve their suffering. We want to think together of ways in which we, as psychoanalysts, can contribute to this world tragedy unfolding before our eyes, as Marianne Amster were mentioning. Naturally and unfortunately, unfortunately, many of our psychoanalytic colleagues have been cut up in the same type of forced exile or voluntary but compelled emigration. When our colleagues look for a new home, they search for countries that will welcome their psychoanalytic skills and allow them to carry on their work. Maybe our offer for help can begin among our own, with our own psychoanalyst colleagues who are becoming immigrants. These are the members from our IPA societies and candidates from our IPA institutes who are going through these difficult experiences of emigration. Belonging to an international association gives us an identity, a feeling that we could go anywhere and continue to belong. But is this something that really happens in our psychoanalytic societies? How do we welcome foreign analysts into our societies? How do we welcome foreign candidates into our institutes? As mental health professionals, it is part of our task to extend our psychoanalytic interests beyond the walls of our offices and immerse ourselves within our means in the problems that afflict humanity, always aware that we are part of a community and part of the world. Our webinar today has been titled Refugees and Immigrants, How Can Psychoanalysis Contribute? In which way can we help immigrants? And in which way can we help our own psychoanal psychoanalyst colleagues who have become immigrants? In 2017, Stefano Bolognini, then president of the IPA, called for the creation of an IPA committee to research and better understand the challenges that psychoanalysts and candidates face when emigrating from their former homes to their new home countries. The committee was mandated to study the legal conditions members need to meet in order to re-establish their practices and examine the opportunities available for reintegration into a psychoanalytic society belonging to the IPA. The work of this committee is to provide information that will assist in making the emigration experience a little less traumatic for our colleagues. It can take a long time to reinsert oneself in a new place, and this committee aims to help facilitate that process as quickly and as smoothly as possible. The IPA Psychoanalyst, Psychoanalyst Emigration and Relocation Committee, PERC, was strongly supported by the new administration of President Virginia Ungar and Vice President Sergio Nick. The committee gathers information that it receives from members and candidates who have already had to immigrate. It organizes this information in a way that can be used by other immigrating members and candidates in similar situations to help them to learn the various rules for applying to IPA societies and institutes in their, in their new home countries, and also about requirements for working legally in the new country or state to which they have moved. In this way, we help emigrating analysts to use the experience of others, and in doing so, save time and effort. We would like to welcome well-trained IPA members coming from other regions as resources, bringing, bringing new perspectives, fresh ideas and creativity, rather than perceiving them as competitors and intruders, as um, Marianne was talking about 
the feeling of the people who are receiving immigrants. This committee expects its work will also help to reduce the number of members who leave the IPA membership and candidates who prematurely end their psychoanalytic training because they need to emigrate and they don't know how to get reestablished and reinserted into a new IPA society or institute. We want to invite our societies and institutes to consider this problem and create rules and structures with generosity and openness to immigrant and refugee IPA analysts from around the world. We want to welcome them, invite them to belong, and open our minds to receive the new ideas they bring from their different cultures and different trainees. While it is not uncommon to feel threatened by that which is foreign, we need to remember that we can also be enriched by our differences. We have the privilege to be to being part of an international association. And if we can welcome our immigrant members and candidates into our component societies, we will have managed to add another substantial benefit to our IPA membership. Fortunately, we share a common language, the psychoanalytic language, and in some ways, this allows us to feel at home wherever we go. Beyond that, we want to open our doors to our displaced colleagues, welcome them to their new home, and carry on with our shared work. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk here and share these ideas with you. Thank you, Adriana, very much for your comprehensive on all immigration processes and also for the specific analysis of uh, this situation within the psychoanalytic community. Well, now comes the turn of our fourth and final panelist, Dr. Jolanda Gamble. Before giving her the floor, I would like to give a, a little background information. Jolanda is a professor in the Department of Psychology and Program of Advanced Psychotherapy at the Faculty of Social Science, Sackler Medical School, Tel Aviv University. She was guest professor of the Sorbonne Paris University Lumiere Lyon. She is a training and supervising analyst and a past president of the Israel Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. She was vice president of the European Federation of Psychoanalysis and was a representative for Europe serving on the board of the International Psychoanalytic Association. The recipient of the Hyman International Prize for published work pertaining to traumatized children and adults and Sigourney's Award. Well, it's your turn, Jolanda. Can you begin? Thank you very much, Ines. <clears throat> I will talk about the experience of exile, external and internal exile. Exile is often thought as a concept indicating an experience of suffering and disconnectedness. It is defined as a state of being expelled from one's homeland and place of residence, tangible and concrete estrangement characterized by an imposed departure and an impossible return. Imposed exile is intimately linked with pain and essentially astromotic. The experience of exile involves the loss of one's own spaces, sensory re reference, uh, people on which to form the identification towards self constitution being dispossessed of everything that constitutes life and the ensuing state of dependence makes us experience how difficult just going on being can be. I refer to exile as an experience of being out of place, 
a key term for human displacement. The immediate meaning makes me think of children expelled from a group, discriminated in class, who find themselves alone, excluded, next scene, or autistic children, or mentally retarded. But there are also ex excised who are forced to live in the street, to unemployed, to homeless, to displaced, to deterritorialize the evicted. Let's just start by considering Freud's experience of exile. March 1938, Hitler invades Austria. Freud's works are destroyed. The Vienna Psychoanalytic Society is falling apart. After a few days of hesitation, Freud gave into John's exhortations, begging him to immigrate to England. Facing a forced departure with no prospect of return, and in the other hand, a very warm welcome in London, Freud writes to his brother Alexander, for the first time, and so late in life, I learned what fame is. But at the same time, there is no consolation for the sadness of exile. And he writes to 81 in June 6, 38, you never cease loving the prison from which you were uh, <coughs> released. The best way to fight moving is by proceeding that life goes on. Through consumed but illness, Freud gets to work. Between June 16 and 22 August 38, when he writes the outline, he also writes notes, nine short and enigmatic fragments. For once, he does not destroy them, as he usually does, and they are eventually published in, uh, in 1941. In these fragments, Freud condenses and releases some of the essential discoveries. I think that it's important to reread this text in light of Freud's experience of exile. And I wonder what affective taste underlying these theoretical writings which he left us. One possible reading of the fragment reveals the vicissitudes of his soul in exile. He seems to slowly shift from denial of exile and the suffering of it causes to accept them. He seems to be wondering whether the ability to witness an experience of abrupt displacement, such as his own exile, may lead to nearly experiencing. In the talk about maturation, the psychic growth that the long one to continue after a rapture has been experienced. It seems to be preoccupied with identification, and implicitly with identity. When he mentioned children's having and being in his note of the 12th of July, is he not saying also something about having and being in exile? Is he not referring to the fact that his exile is linked to his Jewish identity and to his belonging? Let us look at a different kind of exile. In a working group, all participants were asked to briefly describe the place where they feel at home. A 70-year-old man who was born in Frankfurt and was a child during the World War II explains that he only found his owl five years ago. He described how in school his classmates, all Jewish children, began to disappear from school. One other gathered. Sometimes he would ask his mother how come his best friends were suddenly disappearing, like this from school, from one day to the next. He does not remember a reply. But all his life, he wanted to meet his missing friends again. Five or six years ago, he started to look for them and found only one, 
a woman who lives in Cologne in Israel. He traveled from Frankfurt to Cologne to meet her, and even since then, you are being spending all this money with his woman and her family. For the first time in life, he feels at home. There, I was very moved by this reversal of roles. All his friends were exiled, but he, the only one who actually stayed where home was, felt exiled. A five-year-old boy, born in Venezuela and adopted by an Israeli couple, adjusted very well to his surroundings, learned the, the language perfectly, and felt good with his new family and his own. His parents nevertheless felt that some minor details in the case may require therapy. The first uh, session, took place uh, around Rosh Hashanah, like today, the Jewish New Year. At school in Israel, children learn all about these holidays, including the shofar. The shofar is the traditional ghost horn blown like a musical instrument. In our first session, the child made a drawing of an alien with the shofar. No explanation was necessary. This well-adjusted, possibly over-adjusted child did everything that other children did. But at the same time, he saw himself an extraterrestrial in exile at her. What these two stories have in common in the experience of exile in which exile becomes an internal movement that determines one's being and successions of existence. Whatever the cause, exile always involves a violent cut which may cause panic, rage, confusion, or helplessness. The only certain threshold it can produce splits and even dismantle identity causing the victim to fall into a state of wandering. The catastrophic change accompanied by fears of breaking down, of emptiness, of madness, of death, invade the internal scene. The cases presented above illustrate how, in all cases of exile, external and internal, not only past inscriptions are revived, but also experience linked to the social belonging that depends on the present. These adventures of life that excite impose on human beings in place a change of identity and belonging. I am thinking of immigrants, refugees, deportees, victims of disaster, homeless, stateless, evicted, separated from the family, excluded from school, banished from a relationship, those hit by accidents, those injured or hospitalized, elderly people confused in the nursing home. Every single move we run to risk of being left out of the loop, out of place, catapulted out of every life and in the family, with the family reference and heavy. This type of exile imposes on the psychic apparatus a work aimed just and much at preserving the past and at developing the feelings of identity. Described in our social life and in our world, the magnitude of migration confronts the mission with new pathology derived from lost social links and at times from a loss of words to describe past horror. The Shoah and other genocides have been so devastating and showed humanity that death and violence are the most intimate part of our identity. This introduced historical events from external reality into psychoanalysis. They are forced psychoanalysis after a long period of silence to admit modification 
que hasta el Bluetooth Samsung, que hasta el Bill Post lo realza. Something typical. We must try to include and accept that which interferes, that which accepts the happening, that no, do, do not refer to the past and requires new listening. We need to see the clinic from the point of view of the metaphor of silence and invisible radioactive transmission. War, social, political violence, and culture, religion, and even being different from that which is accepted by mainstream power may become sufficient cause for being exiled. How do we think of clinical practice in relation to everyday life or to social and political violence? We must learn to work analytically with the kind of wounds left by social reputation. We are witnessing how psychoanalysts start to concern themselves with terrorist acts, attacks in human rights, politics, and excite with the results from war. Thus, these issues begin to move to the center of theoretical and clinical interest for psychoanalysis. We have learned that social subjectivity is not ruled by the values and logic of inner subjectivity. It requires taking into account that we depend not only in the identification of various effects of the drive, but also on that which exceeds, which we have to include and accept. We must recognize the demand of belonging to collective acknowledge the effects of social terror and realize that existing explanatory models are insufficient for the purpose of dealing with the present and created a new story. Thank you. Thank you, Jolanda, very much for your moving reflection on the experience of exile and its mm -hmm. multiple forms. And you have also underlined, highlighted uh, uh, fundamental current uh, aspects of psychoanalytical theory and practice that I'm sure will be uh, part of our next discussion. Well, we received many questions. Unfortunately, we won't be able to cover all of them. When I, I begin by this one. Um, I work for the past few years in Athens, Greece, setting up mental health programs for shelters that receive mostly unaccompanied uncompany, un children. In the past two, about 9,000 refugees entered the country after Turkey opened the borders. With Europe not accepting refugees, most of them are stuck under horrible condition in Moria or other entry point, not being able to move in the mainland. How do we support that as analysts? Because I feel that our presence as analysts is not strong enough where the acute trauma is actually happening. Well, it's addressed to the whole panel who wants to begin. <coughs> okay, it's fair. Well, I, I think that you, uh, first, uh, you are doing a very important job in a very difficult situation. And we know that uh, the borders now are opening again and many uh, refugees come to the Greek islands and also then to Athens and the mainland. Uh, and uh, on, one, on the one hand, it's uh, not much we as analysts can do in a practical sense, except those of you like you who are working bravely in the, in the field. Uh, but I think that uh, the 
psychoanalyst and uh, I think especially the uh, International Psychoanalytic Association and the European Psychoanalytic Federation as uh, really an important uh, important organization who represents a knowledge on mental health and how to prevent illness should do more on a, a political level to make uh, both the public and the politicians aware of uh, the immense uh, and difficult consequences a long time for especially the children that you are taking care of in Athens. We will have uh, a, a large group of people who uh, will have uh, extreme difficulties later in life. We know that many refugees have a high degree of resilience and can manage uh, and they can be helped in many different ways, like in Mikhailistov and so on. But it's really a very difficult struggle. Uh, so uh, I don't have any real uh, good solutions after I've been studying this problem for many years. But uh, I think, among others, your work is so important. Yeah. May I just uh, add? We we know what uh, what you are doing in Greece, and we admire you. Of course, we all are confronted with the question: What can we do as a profession in this situation? Because it's just overwhelming. And I think, of course, we always have to consider that these are political problems which have to to be solved politically. But as Sverre and all the panelists said. I think it is important that we at least try to be there. And I know that we will, from the Committee for Migrants and Refugees, the IPA Committee will make um, a volume in Troutlich just to let each other know how we are struggling in different countries with this situation. And I'm very happy that Nicolas Tsavaras, who is in the Greek society, he promised to have a contribution. I hope you will have contact with him. I think to communi communicate among ourselves and to exchange the concepts is absolutely necessary. But uh, I think the, 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 the fact is that being with the refugees, and if I hear these numbers and see all the pictures coming from Greece, 9,000, then of course we always think we cannot do anything. But uh, I think we, uh, that's why I, I quoted Greta. I think uh, the alternative is not to do anything. And then we miss a lot also as our, our responsibility of our generation. So thank you for your commitment and your engagement. I have, Nicolas wrote to me that all the candidates of the Greek society you are involved in and committed to this situation, which I thought was just extraordinary. So thank you mm -hmm. all colleagues in Greece for trying to do what, at least what we can do. It's a drop in the ocean, but it is not nothing. Yeah. I was so only wanted to say something, Ines. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, in addition to what Sver and Marianne said, I think that we can also try to help in the way, because it's difficult to work to, to help in a practical way, but you are doing this. The person who is saying this is doing something also practical. And as Marianne said, also a lot of people from the Greek society are also working in this. So I think we can do so many things in the community, also working with the people, which is not easy, but maybe we can try to be more organized in this level as this administration is doing, like IPA in the community. And I think we need also to denounce maybe more and to publish more what we do in these regards, like for other people to know what some of the IPA members are doing in this regard, and maybe you can follow some of the things they are doing. And for example, other than Greece, uh, in other places, some analysts are doing some very, very important work to help refugees and immigrants. Like, for example, uh, Gil, Gil, Gil Kleiman in 
San Francisco. He mm -hmm. is doing a very, very important work in assisting, finding, evaluating, and obtain, obtaining any help necessary for trying to re, um, get together with the immigrant children who were separated from their parents in the United States in this Trump administration. So I think we can do a lot of things if we can go more into the community. And also, I think we, when we publish and we denounce what is, say, what is happening and we mm, write about all the damage that this caused, we are also helping. But I, I thank you so much also for all the work you are doing. Okay. Oh, shall we pass to the next question? Yes. Can we differentiate between emigrant and refugee in order to under, understand the degree of loss and unconscious mechanism present in their suffering and healing approach? Uh, yes, it's fair. Maybe. I, I think it's important to differentiate, differentiate between those who have the possibility to return and to have contact with the origin and those who have not this possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, refugees, they are people who have not the possibility to return. Uh, and there is a lot of legal uh, definitions in the, the newspapers are using different uh, uh, words and so on. But I think it's very important for refugees, they are forcibly displaced from their home. Mm -hmm. uh, and often the home is destroyed and they have to build up a new home in exile, which is a very difficult process. Uh, and. Uh, uh, this uh, demands uh, very, uh, probably a different approach uh, when you do psychoanalysis or psychotherapy, but it definitely demands a uh, different approach in the so psychosocial field uh, when you are helping people adjust and so on and so forth. Uh, and there are so many who are uh, like those who come to Michaelis Dolph. Uh, young mothers with ch newly born children born during flight who would really need to create a kind of home all, already in the reception center. Mm -hmm. It takes a home, it takes a village to uh, to raise for a child to grow. And what they did in Michaeli stores was to create this village that can help uh, people to, to grow and develop. Mm -hmm. I want to say that we are only one vertex of working with people that immigrate or, or that are in that situation. It's a, it's, a, it's a big program where a lot of social uh, and political people have to intervene. We are not the only that will intervene. We have a little piece that can do changes, but we are only a piece. We are not doing the long psychoanalysis in a very uh, all the work. And I think that each situation is differently, and each country is differently, and all people that come from different countries and cultures and languages. And I think that we have to build up something new from a and to, to use our creative capabilities to, to make new things from it, using the point of view of psychoanalysis. But we need to create new instruments for working with that. And we are one, one point of a lot of other points that are doing this work and to do it also together with sociologists, anthropologists, medic, uh, medical services, not only us, and, and, and to create new things, a new theorization of what is in this situation, and a new clinical work 
And, and what, what I say, we can't give uh, uh, instructions what to do. We have not a list. Each situation is another situation, and each group has to be enough creative to create for each situation what they have to create. Mm -hmm. Shall we pass to uh, Adriana? No, I, yes. I just, just wanted to add something that when I'm thinking of emigration, I'm thinking of uh, immigrants who, who voluntarily move and others who don't, they have to move because they are forced. Uh, so there is the, some immigrants can be, can decide with time to move because they want to look for a better life. But uh, when we think of refugees, we, as Sver said, it's like they were displaced, no return. They didn't have any choice and it's, the conditions are much more difficult, no? Mm -hmm. More difficult to elaborate, I think, to, to work through. Mm. Uh, I read now another question aligned with Jolanda comments about the, our need as psychoanalysts to develop new theories and new tools in our practice. Here, the question says, is it trauma or is it catastrophe, a subjective destitution, the most accurate idea to describe the refugee status? Yes, yes uh, Maya. Well, I, I think uh, Yolanda just pointed out a very important thing. I, I think it's um, a balance between being very modest, what we as psychoanalysts can contribute to a very complex and difficult and challenging interdisciplinary dialogue on a com very complex issue. And I think there is, there is uh, some psychoanalytic knowledge about exactly this question you are posing. Trauma research is just one of it. And I mean, what Sveri has done for, I think now three decades, you have written and, and worked on the concepts. I think there are a lot of conceptualizations on trauma. And mm -hmm. uh, with this discrimination between normal migration, forced migration, refugees. So trauma is just one knowledge base for me it was very helpful uh, because uh, living as a Swiss analyst in Germany, uh, still a uh, uh, yeah, society who has to cope with uh, the Holocaust and the, the, the aftermath on, uh, on this collective catastrophe uh, with a lot of collective extreme traumatization. So I think this is one knowledge base which was very helpful. But on the other side, I think I learned a lot also from resilience research. I was mm. full of administration of all, many of these, for instance, African women who mm. just came to, to mm. Europe under unimaginable uh, circumstances. And these, I, I was often just uh, thinking that I would have I don't know if I would have been able to survive what they had gone through. So they were very strong women. Uh, and often, as very said, they became pregnant after rape and they had, uh, they, they, they had their children and they had to cope with all the ambivalences. Well, I don't want to go into details, but I think we still have a lot to do and we have to listen also to other colleagues from other disciplines and then try to bring forward our psychoanalytical concepts in order to help in mm -hmm. this situation. Okay, shall we go on? I thank you all for papers that help me think what is happening in the world and in my office. I have a new awareness that the primitive splitting takes place 
in which the analyst fall into helplessness with the patients and it goes unspoken. There is tremendous power in having active bystanders transmitted from my community, you, to then bring to my parents. Please say more about the creation of the active bystander for us all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, I can uh, yeah, well, understand your, your uh, comment, uh, actually, that um, there are bystanders who are active and there are bystanders who are passive. And the active bystanders are uh, really important persons in the, the traumatized and the refugees' life. Uh, and uh, what we, I think there was the example from Athens, from Greece, where the refugees live under really difficult circumstances. And we, uh, also in Italy and so on, uh, where those who work with the refugees, uh, they are doing a great job, but they have really bad working conditions. And it is these working conditions that are the biggest problem, not meeting the traumatized. We have research on that as well. Uh, but they are active bystanders. And uh, uh, they are the community, the welcome refugee movements is an active bystander. And of course, as a psychotherapist or psychoanalyst, the way you listen to the stories uh, is so important that you are able to work with the counter-transference, try not to be overwhelmed, and try to be in a position where you let, let the people speak about the horrible things that they have experienced without trying to modify or uh, do things with it. That's really uh, the prime example of active and an active witness, uh, which is uh, 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 really helping people to rep repair this uh, damage to the connection, the link to the inner empathic imprint. Maybe I just can add, I think, at least I can only talk about myself. I wasn't aware how specific the psychoanalytical is. Of course, we have other professions who try to cope. I mean it not in a devaluating way, but they have a more a technical approach to trauma. They, you know, they um, want to help the traumatized to put away the pain in a very technical sense. And that is very different what we are doing as psychoanalysts, to try to help them to bear the unbearable and to understand that it is their specific history of trauma and try to find a way back to their own self, to their individual. And they can only do that if we, through to our privileged um, training, give them the space to integrate or try to integrate the unbearable into their own identity. And I think this is very specific um, that uh, discriminates us from, from many different professions, which of course we, we think uh, has sometimes also a kind of a, um, a possibility to be used as a defense that you don't have really to emphasize with the unbearable what the traumatized refugees have gone through. Mm -hmm. I hope this is understandable. That doesn't mean that we are the best. I just wanted to say that there is something specific about the psychoanalytic attitude meeting the traumatized, which I think um, is, in my experience, proved to be helpful in contrast to others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
I read the next question. Identity may be a concept which doesn't help people to build their everyday need to get aware that we live in a world changing. Life is an ongoing situation. We have to look at present and future and not only about past history. Psychoanalysts must be able to do something more than denouncing what is going on in the world, since newspapers give account of it. Do you agree with this? I agree completely with this. With the denunciation we have in the newspaper, we have not to denounce. We have to try to work. And it's not only with our knowledge that as psychoanalysts, for example, I worked with a group of young doctors and psychologists that went to the island facing the Syria to receive the people that wait in both. And they come and, and they were there as young people uh, bringing medicine to save, to give them, to grief. The psychologists take the children of the ends. They do a wonderful work, not with words, but with doing and being with these people. When they come back to Israel, they need very much to talk about all that because they have seen terrible things and, and, and they want to, to brief with us and to see what more they can do. So a psychoanalyst, in general, in what I see in Israel, the young, very young uh, candidates are working with children of uh, with children of people, and the elder gives supervision to that, or gives a possibility to contain the working team in a very difficult world that is not only words. See, I, I want to say something. I think that the the idea, I think is more than denouncing is to talk and publish and write about what is happening i think it's not only a denounce is to say this is what happens and we as mental health professionals think this is what the effect and the consequences of what is happening it could could do so for example i think it was very useful i think when last june for example Virginia Ungar and Sergio Nick, they published a letter in a newspaper rejecting Donald Trump's policy of separating the immigrants' children from their parents, I think, and explain why that is so damaging. Or, for example, also, I think Lee Jaffe, the president of the uh, American Psychoanalytic Association, he also published a letter recalling the results of the study of Anna Freud during the Second World world in which uh, it was found that children in war zones who were separated from their parents and moved to uh, places that are more safe did far worse than other children who suffered the bombing attacks in bomb shelters but with the parents so i think or, or what the, as i said before what the uh, gail Kleinman was doing i'm thinking that i think it's important for us also to say something and explain why this is so damaging and it's so um, perturbing to mental health. So, so I think, of course, there are a lot of things I, we, that we can do. And I think one thing is to share our knowledge in that. And, and yes, it's true that the world is changing and we cannot focus only in the past, but the past is important for us to learn also and to you know to, to learn from that experience so in order to try not to repeat or to help with the experience give me a short comment yes please the, the traumatized the past yes. is too much the present so it's so important to help people to free themselves from uh, is recurring, but really painful memories, and to be able to look forward 
that's the main task of uh, doing psychoanalytic or psychotherapeutic work with traumatized, also with refugees. Well, the last question that is uh, addressed to Jolanda, but of course you, you can all participate. Um, what can you tell us about the racism to the Palestinian in Israel? How the psychoanalysts in Israel are helping to look for a world convivence of cultures and people? This is a question with a long answer. I mm -hmm. can say that Israeli psychoanalysts and the Israeli society is very involved in working where we can and uh, uh, with Palestinians who have a very long tradition of work and meetings personally people with Gaza since 89, since they all begin. So it's very, very long. The situation that all the work that we have done uh, didn't change the political situation. And the political situation went worse and worse. The only relation that we have now is through is through, um, or by telephone or by Skype. And it's very difficult because people that are talking with us, they are in a, in not a good situation from the other side. So <laughs> it's, a, it's very difficult. And there is a lot of things that Israeli psychoanalysts, lawyers, medicine are doing it in impossible situations. I think that what you say, Adriana, that maybe we have to publish more what we are doing. Uh, and we are uh, to publish much more. The political situation is very bad, very bad. And it's from year on year, I, if I see all the 20 years that I worked in Gaza and I see what happens now there, is to feel it's very, very impossible said. And I think that a psychoanalyst can do in a very strict, uh, super, in a very strict geography to work. When you say that it's very important to work through, if you have 2,000 or 3,000 immigrants or 3,000 um, people, refugees, you can help two or three with psychoanalysis. So because of that, we have with our elements to think and find out creatively more, more things that we can help more people. To working through and make an analysis is one, and we have thousands of thousands of people to learn more about group work, to help more the elders, and uh, a, a lot of work to do. And the question Palestine is, uh, is very complicated, but our society is very involved. Do you want to add some comment? Well, <clears throat> I can just say on the line that I know Yolanda yes. has worked for a long time with the Palestinian inside Gaza and also from the outside. And she has done a, a tremendous job. I know the Israeli society is really involved in this work. I am, I am not the only. It is no, I yes. Yeah, I must just say from the outside, I mean, you, you, 
it's sometimes so hardly to imagine how you can stand just the situation, as you said, that the political reality became worse and worse in spite of your engagement and that you are not demotivated to withdraw just behind the couch, but to start, uh, you continue to be committed and to try to discuss the situation. So I have uh, a lot of admiration for the work you have done, Yolanda, and your group. Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, we our time comes to an end. Um, thank you very much for your contributions. I'm, I'm confident it, it's very useful, although, as Marianne says, more than once, it's only a drop in the ocean, but um, we have to be confident in, in new horizons. Well, we'll leave now. Um, yes, Rolanda. I think yes. that what is important that this term, this film, Oh, but that why working today in this panel became a central problem in the IPA. And, and to think about that and to see what we can do, even if you can do a little bit, it's very important that psychoanalytic, uh, uh, the collective psychoanalysts intervene and we don't make a blind eye of things that they don't see in the world. And that's bravo. Thank you, Jolanda. Uh, thank you to all. Uh, last word. No, our next webinar will take place on October 27th. At that time, the subject will be towards a psychoanalytic ethic on the feminine with Julia Cristeva. Uh, we hope you'll join us again. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.